you go out to make gold or the, you have a very leisurely dinner out and then you can go back to your hostel. And I think that we were... You want to say something? While he's just doing this, I'm going to read you some D.H. Lawrence, because I didn't think I had time, but if he's going to have a video, I'm going to read you some D.H. Lawrence. <laughs> the novel has a future. It's got to take the courage to tackle new propositions without using abstractions. It's got to present us with new, really new feelings, a whole new line of new emotion which will get us out of the emotional rut. Instead of snivelling about what it is and has been or inventing new sensations in the old line, it's got to break a way through like a hole in the wall. I wanted to bring out this idea of breaking through as just an additional metaphor to the ones that Claude had used to organise his uh, programme over these days. Right, are we ready? Are you ready with the song? No, you can use the mic.
you can access this uh, program on the screening method. Thank you very much. I'm reminded of a poster that we have in our department that Zul just stole, which says, if the product is free, you are the product. <laughs> so, they are almost, no, you are going to ask last. If there is nobody else, I'm going to ask. No, let's Yes, anybody in the back there? Any question? Everybody's, everybody's tired. <laughs> Okay, so my question is to you because I mean you uh, kept saying that uh, Betson, she said she is a PhD in philosophy and she talked about using quantum mechanics. Presumably because you want to show the interconnectedness of everything as it appears in our culture. So what you need is decolonized physics. Now in that decolonized physics which I talked about, which relates to quantum mechanics. It's called the structure time interpretation of quantum mechanics, but I don't want to get into those technicalities. The point is that with this sort of a physics, you have spontaneity. You have some kind of time travel if you like, some kind of spontaneity and that involves interconnectedness. Let me just explain. No, 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 not the conversation. The Popper's Pond Paradox. There is something called Popper's Pond Paradox that you take a, normally you throw a stone in a pond. Why is the chairman moving this out? This is not a question. I am trying to relate it to ethics. You are not allowed to have another panel, another chance, another lecture, another guy to talk about ethics. You ask a question. I am making a comment. To which she will respond. <laughs> you are giving a comment, you are not asking. You ask. Now, let me ask, let me ask Sean the question. Can I uh, make one comment? Please I, I, I'm not sure entirely where you are going, but I'm, uh, I'm happy to be your student. I'm not ready. The point is, you talked about the desirability of environment. Now, desirability is not enough. There is so much of a push to create consumers, as you mentioned. There is so much of a push for the capitalist value of consumerism. It's not just at the end, at the other end, at the bottom of end, you are free to do that. And that is contrary to your idea of sustainability or your idea of preserving the environment. So you can link these two together through the harmony principle that I talked about. There has to be some element of, uh, what should I say, some element of force behind the ethical principle. Not force as in uh, my laying things down, but force as in force of conviction. And that can only come from a view of the world. It cannot come merely by saying, let us have more concern for the world. Because the people say, why should you have concern? You have to answer that question. The basic. Um, I, I'll, my comment, which might not encompass all your thinking, it, number one, I'm not only looking at an ethics that is more analogous to a Māori worldview, it's also some principles that are needed for a world of interdependence. And it's not intended as simply desirable. Um, I'm working with, uh, with uh, um, lawyers and judges to bring about laws of, of public trusteeship as an expression of responsibility. So I'm not seeing this as simply an attitudinal change, but something that we need, this framework of responsibility needs to be brought into law and into a systemic shift. The point was that if you have this, you cannot have law. Well, you can never... Law brings down. You can never... Connectedness, if you have this uh, uh, in going, you have to have judgment. You cannot have one rule. You cannot lay down the perfect rule 
as no. you know, for a computer, it's impossible. No. Well, well, law it. is not only for regulation, it's also for transformation. Uh, but, but you can never capture everything within law. I, I, I fully agree with that. You can't codify attitudes and, and responsibility in, in the full I ethical sense. Wrong. Yeah. I got to think you're wrong to have a law. Because that is, if one has God who rules the world with eternal laws, if you have a Ghazali, you have a law, who creates the world continuously with habit, not law. Can I ask you? Yes. I think that the two of you are giving us sort of contradictory you know, positions of the language. He sees the English language as a threat because it's being used by the United States government, which has always been up to no good, for <laughs> ensuring whatever cultural influence, etc. But you see language in a totally liberating way, and if you have this version of the language, if you have the game successful, etc., you won't have a DH college in the future. If everybody writes English the way the Americans want you to write English, because then it becomes just a simple mechanical tool, functional tool, and you learn a video game. There's nothing creative anymore. So how do you view this? I, I would say that I agree with everything that he said. Um, and that the particular modes of uh, American soft power through language are very similar to modes of European and specifically British soft power through language that took place in earlier periods. But in changing the narrative, what we say is people appropriate that language, they adapt that language, and then they make that language their own. And the amazing thing is that during the Cold War, when the American CIA were funding all kinds of um, uh, activities which they thought were going to kind of push American values. The Congress for, what was the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which supported several magazines and, and different cultural kind of activities. Many of the people who were involved in those activities were unaware of their funding. We're, we're kind of horrified later on, but then once you start studying, say, Encounter, which is a very important British magazine, you look at the content of that magazine, it was, it was in many ways radical, it was in many ways liberal and questioning, and was far from entirely sympathetic to American power. So it's, it's very difficult to me to, to think that any language is going to embody a, a, party, a partisan set of values. The English language will ultimately be broken apart and will, will develop amongst its language community in many different ways. Um, and as I say, in terms of literature, the English expression has, has been completely changed by its collision with different um, knowledge communities and artistic communities. So I, I don't think they stand a chance. I think it's uh, that they're I mean, if we want to go back to surgical metaphors, they're introducing a virus into, the, into their plan that will, will actually kind of come back to the host. It will, it will come back. And frankly, within America itself, there is, there is no um, simple homogenous relation to language. It's a very diverse, multicultural environment, and it's a, it's a very radically experimental literary and artistic environment. And I think Interestingly, we're in Malaysia, we've just established our School of English Studies, and the highest recruitment uh, program has been for creative writing. People who are second and sometimes third language um, Anglophone um, are wanting to use that language in new and creative ways. So I, I don't think language is actually, I think there's some very naive soft power policy makers there. They just look foolish to me because language in reality doesn't work like that. I don't How do you respond to it? Okay. Because uh, what he say is correct, because people do appropriate language. I agree with uh, most of what he says, but uh, there are two things that we have to distinguish. One is the policy of the governments. And this is not only with the US government, it's British, as you said, it's Russians, Chinese. They're all expressing on their teaching languages with one purpose. And that's, it's not enlightening people to understand it. Uh, cultures or get knowledge is to influence the people through the changing the cultures and teaching them that they are have a superior culture except their own. So this is what they're doing and they are not actually naive 
because what they're doing, they have started from 1954, I think, after the Second World War. Yeah, yeah, it's a United States Information Agency, which was formed in nine after the Second World War. They have done a lot of propagation against Russians in the Cold War era. And one of the major things that they were stressing on it was the English language teaching. And the propaganda that they were doing with the VOA and uh, the other one is BBG, the broadcasting of the government, and uh, the books that uh, they are producing. It's a tremendous number of books that they're tremendous they are producing. And the countries have uh, selected two things. One is changing the alphabets, and it has been done in Malaysia, it has been done in Turkish. They were not successful in Iran. Because changing the alphabet is, uh, the, what do you call it, this continuation of the culture of the people with their uh, past. The, the Malaysians cannot read their uh, old history or old poems or whatever. And the Turkish is the same thing too. But in Iran, they are uh, telling these people that if you want to learn a language, you have to learn through their, their culture. And this is the dangerous part of it. But just finishing one. What we are trying to finish, you can take my picture before strangling him. <laughs> in, in Iran, actually, we are trying to teach English through our own culture. One comment on English uh, is that a sentence is made of a subject and an object, so there is a structural guard that is in addition to what, what you're saying completely overrides the interconnected view of the world. Yeah, I was going to say that certainly, just to get back to, to relevance, conceptual relevance changes from language to language, and so English is limited in its conceptual range. It has itself adopted and taken on new concepts that are new words and, and neologisms. The only other thing I would, I would say about what you said is that notwithstanding my sympathy with your view on American power, English isn't taught by websites. English is taught by people like us. And the beauty of it is that we see through these websites and if we come back to the teachers, it's the teachers who make the difference. And as you say, appropriate the language for their own education context, I hope. But as I bet some point, is really key that, that certain grammatical and syntactic structures absolutely make it impossible to say certain things that some languages can say, and, and language itself translation. The idea that placenta and earth are the same term, that's just invisible in English, and so that's a whole kind of structure and approach to the world. It's, it's just different. 20 minutes time, please. <laughs> uh, I agree with him. Do you know, uh, I didn't have enough time. I have about 30, 360 some slides. What you're saying is true. They not, they're not doing it just through the English language. Even the English language, they have different programs that they're doing. And one of them is this uh, website and this. But it's not that. It's teaching through the, uh, through the teachers. Uh, Obama has uh, uh, taken uh, one uh, program, which is 100,000 students to be traveling to China within a few uh, 20 years or so. And uh, he has uh, taken another uh, uh, program, which is 100,000 student exchange with Latin America. And they are saying themselves that through, through these exchanges, the Americans can learn the Chinese uh, culture and try to uh, transfer their own culture with them. And with the uh, Latin America, the program is worse than that. And they want to bring 100,000 Latin America students to learn American culture and language. There is nothing wrong to learn American culture and language. What do you want? <laughs> but this is my microphone, it's not it. If you are working in the, at the university, it doesn't mean that you can uh, influence my, <laughs> take my, you cannot take my microphone. Now. <laughs> and there are tremendous number of programs, I have it in my uh, slide, tremendous number of programs that is designed 
to teach the youngsters from other countries to live American way. So this is, I don't like, time is over. <laughs> this, this actually, to come at this from an entirely different perspective, um, the other work that I do in trans is about transnational education and is about mobility and exchange. And there are huge programs, as you say, about moving students around and ensuring that students share and exchange and experience different cultures. And I think we're getting into a slightly difficult and problematic area if we're saying that isn't in many ways a very good thing. Many of the Americans that I've met in Europe have been transformed by their presence in Europe. Similarly here in Malaysia, although you don't see so many Americans here in Malaysia perhaps, but sending Americans to China, I think that's a great idea because they're going to go back home different if they go back home to I would like to add to that because I get a lot of people coming to India. Please, please. <coughs> from Germany and on, from Holland and then after six months they don't want to go back. <laughs> they want to stay there and they want to settle up. But anyway, that's just being fun. I, I think we should reward Lutu for standing up for the last ten minutes. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> just one yes, minute. Panel go, panel go. I have a second. I'm coming a long way to here to speak. <laughs> But I don't. Uh, okay, please. <laughs> okay, uh, I will address the first question to you. Um, Iran has a huge diaspora uh, in America. Diaspora, diaspora in, in America. What is its role in the protection um, of uh, American power this way? It's good to learn in English this phrase, learn to say no, okay? Learn to say no. It's a very good thing to teach in our schools, for example, through the English language. But what do they mean by saying, learn to say no? They mean to say, if your uncle comes and tells you as a kid, come and sit on my lap, you learn and tell them no. Because they're thinking in American culture, when your uncle sits you on his lap, he is thinking about bad things about you. But in our culture, the relation between uncle and the niece, you call it, is very, very close. And it's a family relations. We are not breaking our family's relations. They even teach you if your father tells you, come and hug me, you learn to say no. But the father is there to hug his son or daughter. So these are the things that you know. Now, in Iran, don't think about the Iranians in America. That's even worse in Iran. The child, instead of saying ma dad, ma dad or mama, is saying say mommy. Okay? Instead of saying pedad, your baba, which has the cultural roots, it says papa or papi. Father, something like that. It is changing the relation, the, the way that the child is talking to his parents is changing. And this, over time, will reach to the point that for the families right now, instead of having the good family like the Malaysians do, that I'm really proud of our Malaysian friends, having three, four children, they come up only with one child. Because they cannot communicate and have... Now, the Iranians which are in uh, the United States, living in the United States, have culturally been uh, really bombarded. And since uh, we're living there, they have got a lot of their habits. And they have a very difficult time coming back to Iran and living with that culture again. It started with... I remember 30 years ago, during the war, when I came back to Iran, you know, everybody was running from Iran when there was a war, but we came back. They finished our schools in, the, in America and we came back. Uh, the first morning, my eldest son, which is around 35 years old now, 
He woke up and said, Daddy, I want um, oranges. I said, forget about it. What do you mean by oranges? There's no oranges in your breakfast this morning. Okay? No, it's either cheese or bread. Oh, that was at the time of the war. You know? It was very difficult to find orange. Now you want oranges? Okay. And then he wanted some other things. Later on, he was four years old only. Later on, he uh, really understood and felt a love that my family could give him. He could really feel the love. But over there in America, he was, uh, he was uh, lacking that love. Now, the, all of this comes through the culture. And I'm not saying, I'm not defying uh, the American culture. It's good for them, I don't care anymore. You know. But I don't want anybody to impose his own culture to me. That's all that, what I mean. Let me live my own life. I want to learn English, I learn English through my uh, political culture. If I want to change my writings, I change it. Why, why should you change my thing? And we have a lot of, uh, in Iran, about 45. The good thing is that I'm old enough that I've seen these things in my country happening. There was a big debate at the time of the previous government to change the writing of our language. And we are rich in poetry. You know, all of you know, we have Mulano, we have office. And imagine if we had done that at that time. What would happen to our new, I mean, youngsters? They would be completely disconnected with their own culture. So I'm not against English language, I'm not against Russians. I'd love to learn Deutsch, but I couldn't learn it because it was difficult. I'd love to learn all the languages. Because I want to say greetings to people. I want to say that I like them, I love them. I like to learn uh, Malay. But I'm uh, old, I cannot learn anymore. That one. I can, but you know, it's difficult. I'd like to learn it, but I don't like somebody pushes me and tells me to, you have to do this and that and that and that. And that. The lesson is that you have not answered Bobby's question because he's still standing. What was the question? The second question was that to show me. In the UK, uh, there has been this assertion uh, of Welsh nationalism, the Scotch nationalism, and of course there's all the Irish nationalism. What is this done to the novel? How is it reflected in, uh, in that novel? The, then the last bit is, uh, the, how do you account for uh, the resurgence of the Harry Potter <laughs> John, uh, what does it say? It's, I can actually have a lecture on Harry Potter if you want me to give it, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but we, we study Harry Potter as a 1990s phenomenon, um, and it is, it's really interesting in the way that Harry Potter is, is extraordinarily successful, and I'll come back to the other the question, because of the way that it utilizes and exploits um, a whole series of common cultural stories about magic, about um, transitions from um, childhood to youth and the accession to maturity and responsibility and it, and it draws on all kinds of other previous writings of magical stories and grail legends and quest narratives and so it, it's, it's extraordinarily rich in the number of different story codes it employs so it's no surprise to me in one sense also there's a, there's a great British tradition of the boarding school story that it, like, that it takes on as well, if you think of Tom Jones and all those stories. So, so it's actually a very clever piece of writing. But to go, to go back... Before you leave that, I was asking the question, I was coming from Killer's context, mm. how um, the system digs up old things mm. and then puts them to use. Mm. Um, fairy tales, magic and so on.